Welcome to Thrive Talks, the podcast covering all things to do with sustainability, thrivability, and the important policy changes happening around the world. Hi, I'm Rebecca from the Thrive Project at the not-for-profit tech and research forum. And I'll be your host as we talk with our experts and special guests about all the thrivability matters affecting the world today. This week, I'm pleased to welcome Alexandra Harrison, an expert in the construction of renewable energy projects. This week, we are talking a first look at clean energy and affordability and how large-scale industry is taking up renewables. The UN's seventh sustainable development goal is focused on energy, and its aim is to ensure access to affordable, reliable, sustainable energy for all. Alexandra has worked on many such projects, including large-scale wind turbines, solar and large battery storage, as well as hybrid systems. So thank you for joining us, Alexandra. How are you? I'm well, thank you. That's good. Okay, so getting started, um, how close are we, in Australia especially, to actually switching our major industries to becoming renewable? Australia, when you compare it to the... um, the 1.5 degree targets that we need to um, aim for as a a global movement uh, in order to protect the the climate against climate change uh, and uh, reverse against what is currently happening uh, on planet earth is probably one of the lagging countries so right so we're, we're pretty far behind the ball in terms of achieving that sustainability goal and keeping the impact from down to 1.5 degrees. Um, do you find that some industries are more uh, open to, to adopting renewable energies than others? Absolutely. Uh, in Australia specifically, what we are finding is that industry is the leader uh, in terms of initiatives and progress in renewable embra- embracing renewable energy and um, mitigating climate change uh, from an energy perspective when we compare it to what is happening at a policy level. Thankfully, what we're seeing in the uh, in the political space in Australia is that we are moving uh, more so towards embracing change, especially post uh, COP. 26 that uh, we had at the end of last year, which is really positive uh, for us as a, as a nation. That being said, that's um, there are organized there are countries around the world that are in, that have embraced um, the climate change movement uh, earlier on, and there are even countries around the world that are already um, in the the negative. Um, climate impact stage. Right, so they're not producing the the carbon, they're not negatively impacting the environment. Um, So would you say that it's probably a lack of of policy and and support from the government that is holding us back as as a country and holding industries in Australia from adopting more renewable um, energies? It's fair to say uh, in response to that, comment that uh, industry is likely to act to whatever the the policies require them to and very often um, there would be a financial impact and a cost implication to the profit margin of organizations to go beyond that Um, but what we're seeing specifically in Australia is that there is a big push from industries to to go beyond what the uh, the policies have required to date. Um, a lot of the policies in Australia relating to renewable energy and embracing uh, climate change improvement of behaviour within Australia is generally had generally until recent uh, the COP26 outputs that we have seen of late um, have literally been five years old, which right. is a significant delay in Australia's action and embracing what has been happening the world over. So we're just lagging behind the rest of the world in, in, in that sense. Yeah. Um, what, what would you say, I mean, this is obviously speculation, but what do you think is the biggest driver for industry leaders in actually adopting renewable energies? There's a lot of social ethics 
that is um, driving behaviour. And what we have found, what has been observed a lot um, in in society and in industry at large, is that um, if uh, the social ethics is a large enough pressure that obliges industry to move beyond whatever the policy of the country um, requires of them, you will see a great change, which in turn will see an improvement in policy if the government is too slow to act. We, we've seen this in numerous, um, in numerous ways across multiple sustainable fields, whether it be water, um, sanitation, even things like if, if we're going back and we compare um, climate change behaviour, and I'm, I'm sort of making a very loose connection here, but I think people will understand the the very the the, the parallel I'm trying to make is um, CSC gases. Um, before governments decided to implement policy change, there there was a lot of movement by um, by society and society. Um, change impact that resulted in industry and governance in that part so could you expand on that a little bit because i'm not familiar uh, what um the the cds gases what uh policy changes happened there Sorry. yeah so cfc gases um up until the 90s um was what was used as refrigerants in our fridges Right. Okay. Um, and they and they were a large part of every refrigerator that was purchased. Pretty much had these, but there was a time at which the damage to our ozone layer uh, was impacting on planet Earth to the to the point where consumers were saying, "No, we are we are expecting that manufacturers will acknowledge this." Um, and pe- and then community at large started purchasing products that were cost that were more costly that did not have this product that was damaging the environment, which in turn, um, which we know now, was actually a direct contributor to damaging our our environment. And it was a major sustainability, uh, firstly, improvement. Do you think that consumer choice definitely drives that kind of action as well? People want to to pick companies that are sustainable? Yeah, yeah. And that's where this um, this social movement is making such a huge impact. Uh, if we uh, take this back to uh, what is happening uh, in terms of the renewable energy space, um, from a manufacturing perspective, organisations are realising that purchasing renewable energy products is going to be a long-term positive cash impact, yep. whereas the initial outlay might be the, the part that is a bit of a pinch. And that's where um, there need to be government incentives to, to drive for those organisations the, the push to integrate these positive renewable energy uh, movements. But that's not to say that... Um, large enterprise should be the only one that is responsible for this movement because we have recently learned that, you know, small enterprise uh, organi- entities, uh, they're the leading uh, movement in terms of employment out there. So in t- if we're going to, to look at that space alone, we need to also acknowledge the fact that um, small and medium enterprises have a place to play that can make that transition speed up. Yeah, absolutely, of course. Um, what are some of the obstacles, um, like specific obstacles that you think we're, we're facing in switching to 100% renewable energy? At the moment, there's a lot of um, carbon-centric, which is, uh, you know, um, different processes that are very reliant on a carbon as the fuel source uh, for, for managing uh, its operations, whether that be logistics. So we're looking at transportation. Um, uh, obviously, there is agriculture is another really large one of where yeah, of um, agriculture relies very heavily on carbon fuels to, to power its um, operations. Um, then we have power in itself. Um, power is the, the when people think uh, power, they generally think coal fired power plants. Um, in Australia, their um, Australian energy market operator, which is the Australian um, entity, uh, the Australian government entity that runs and um, manages the uh, the commissioning and decommissioning of 
its power stations and also um, the obligations in terms of its grid, uh, which is you know, the power lines that you yeah. see out and about on the street. It's already got a plan in place that in, by 2046, it should have 100% of all of its coal-fired power plants decommissioned and replaced with renewable sources. So that's a that's a really positive step forward. Where we're moving toward, we have a plan in place, but that again feeds back to the fact that we need to do this plan needs to be um, brought forward um, because it's not currently lining up with this 1.5 degree um, temperature reduction. Right, so basically working. the current efforts, that they're, they're not enough to actually make the kind of difference that we need to be yeah. making, yeah, Absolutely. of course. Okay, um, moving back to the more technical aspects of renewable products, what kind of plans do you have for end of life cycle um, for things like solar panels and wind turbines and batteries? From a, an industry point of view, this is very much an emerging industry. Of course, yeah. From a policy perspective, Australia still has none. Uh, no, no policies that regulate for waste and end of life. The largest contributing policy to that that I'd probably caveat my statement with is to say that anything that's a, um, a very direct recyclable material goes to its particular scrap, whether it's aluminium or it's uh, or steel or so forth. However, that being said, when we're looking at the sheer volume of solar panels that we're anticipating are going to go to landfill in the next decade. A solar panel has a design life of 25 to potentially 30 years. Generally speaking, it okay. will be replaced sooner than that. But when we are looking at millions, millions and millions worth of solar panels that are going to be discarded uh, and entering landfill over the next 10 years, that is of considerable concern. And so what we have, uh, what I have been um, privy to and observed is just even in the last 12 months, the number and calibre of recycling stations and recycling enterprises that are coming up is increasing. So where, say, 12 months ago, we might have had two now in the organisation I'm currently working with, just as a, an example from industry, um, we have had to, to deal with some damages and some, um, some waste disposals of modules, which hold a lot of um, minerals in them that right, yeah. can be recycled and reused and, and they're quite easily recyclable, uh, copper, nickel, silver, aluminium even, and then you've also got the silicon, um, which is, you know, the basis of the, the surfaces. So all, all of these being recyclable materials. In Australia, without any um, initiative, there would be no reason to recycle it. So um, what has happened in the last six months is the Australian government has, um, and very, especially driven by state governments, depending on which state government um, it, you're in, will give yep. you better uh, incentives as an emerging um, industry provider. But we're, we're seeing more of these recycling stations and recycling companies coming to the forefront. Right. So that's, yeah, there's definitely a need there and we're, we're seeing industry come to meet that. But it would definitely help if we had some kind of planning and infrastructure from governments to, to ease that along. Right. Yeah. Um, are there any, like, ongoing costs associated with maintaining those renewables? Like, because yes. you do have to eventually replace things. Uh, can you tell me a bit about those? So um, the the two uh, renewable systems that I'm that I am uh, familiar with is the ones that I, I can talk predominantly to. But generally speaking, uh, there is a level of cost that is associated across the board with any type of renewable energy uh, power system. So um, from a solar perspective, obviously we need to keep the panel surface is clean because clean surface equals more radiance that need that can be absorbed by the modules, which means that we have um, the maximum amount of power that is generated per module. Why that's important is if we think about where predominantly these um, large scale solar farms are, we will find that they are generally in non high populated areas. So they might be high dust 
Uh, right. So Victoria has a huge amount of large scale solar farms that are um, that are within quite prominent corridors across the state of Victoria, and they reach all the way out to the border of uh, South Australia. And so that's important because the further up you go, the more dusty the environment. So therefore, you're going to get you need to clean them out. and yeah, 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 absolutely right. Much like your windows at home and yeah. your um, and your windscreens in your cars, so you can't drive a car without having it clean because you can't see through it. Um, so that's just a basic one. Obviously, um, so that's from above. But then if we think about it from below, um, what we find, what has been found, and uh, there was this amazing article that was published in the last three months by PV Magazine. It published the results of what would happen if we had vegetation beneath solar, uh, solar panels. And what they found is there was over 20% increase in the performance of the modules. And the reason for that is because we're reducing the amount of heat that is caused by these modules, which, as we know, in the Australian temperatures, yeah. or even if you think about America, if you think about um, the Middle East, you're going to have these extraordinarily extraordinary heat environments, these temperate climates that are going to cause deterioration of these modules. Imagine extending the lifetime of these instead of them being 25 years, they're now 30 years. If instead of being 30 years, they're 35 year. Um, and so you're delaying the time that they get chucked into. Does waste. that also help um, reduce the impact on the local ecosystems as well if you're having vegetation under there or was that not explored in the article? That wasn't really explored. I think what they found, what they followed the most was what is the the peak power that was being generated by the modules, and what was the temperature that was being caused. So they had two buildings side by side in uh, one of our capital cities here in Australia, and what they did is they implemented, they installed equal size. Um, panels equals quantity of panels and then they measured and they made sure that there was no shadowing um, so it was equal shadowing that was happening and the exposure that they were being given and what they found is the one without any vegetation underneath was experiencing a larger heat out during operation which was yep. reducing the amount of power that they were generating and providing to the uh, the system whereas the one with vegetation beneath had a much lower temperature for operating um, it was it was just like being in a a much more refreshing environment I suppose yeah, yeah absolutely I mean that's that's going to be all around good um, yeah. what are some of the misconceptions around renewable energy that you've encountered Ah, oh, yes, the <laughs> misconceptions. There are a lot, you know, you wouldn't think it because you think sun, free power. Um, do you know one of the ones that I, I probably joke about the most with colleagues is that it is the white horse. And, and by that, there are quite a number of people who think that it's a generator of funds for a construction company to make money on the build and there's no money in the actual of building and there's no benefit to building a solar farm because you need what are you going to do at night right okay so they don't so, think about like storing the power or anything like that they don't consider yeah. batteries or well yeah. the the these are also the so the the persons I have worked with and, and ironically these are people who actually work in the industry very few mind you very few and and they're getting less, these ones, thankfully, because I think people are just getting on board and realising. So the misconception is that, of course, we're going to need coal because what are we going to run at night? How are we going to run our lights at night? How are we going to run our air cons and our ovens at night? Um, yeah, that's what wind's for. That's what battery's for. <laughs> yeah, there yeah. Are, and that's what hydro is for. Yeah, it doesn't so have to be the coal powered absolutely that that does seem to be some of the one of the biggest um objections that people bring up when yeah. they, they they're against renewables absolutely i do um, have another one to that one yeah so the other one is um ev so electric vehicles right um, yep there's no way they are viable or feasible um because you can only drive down the street and then your battery will die right really really <laughs> that's like saying you can't go camping because your battery and your torch is gonna die yeah and your battery yeah you know and of, it won't go flat 
So yeah, it's um, look, we've come a long way with EVs. It's fair to say it's we're not in in early days anymore, and it's an exciting time. And I think we we are seeing the world over that there is an explosion. There there was even a like. This time last year, there was a very strong attitude that EVs just were not a viable option and that they would never be an option in Australia. Uh, and what we're finding is that the market consumers are, are making the choice to disagree with that attitude. Well, considering that we don't have a lot of infrastructure for public transport and things like that, so we all drive cars uh, all around the place like and that that's obviously contributing a lot so if we did have you know charging stations everywhere and we we were all embracing and using electric vehicles that would absolutely cut down on things so absolutely yeah, yeah. um in brisbane in the state of queensland there is a private bus in organization that um services uh, a local um council area that has converted 85% of its buses to EV. Wow, that's awesome. And that has been in the last three months. And this is under the attitude that EVs are non-viable and they're making money. That is a profitable entity, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, It's yeah. not a myth anymore. It's not a misconception. It is both feasible. Uh, if you did the cost calculation on how long, how much it would cost you to purchase an EV versus a uh, traditional internal combustion engine vehicle, brand new, and the running costs on a daily basis add up over, on an internal combustion Well, yeah, engine. like especially with the price of fuel at the moment, it's, it's all right. through the roof. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Do you think that Australia is in a better or worse position to shut down coal power plants than the rest of the world? From where I sit, it's in an excellent position to do that. Um, and it, it, the 2040 something, um, you know, plan can easily be brought forward. Uh, thankfully, the Australian government has gotten on board, like I said before, post COP26. And what we are finding is that uh, there have been um quite a lot of those um, coal-fired power stations that have been brought forward for decommissioning uh, in the next decade uh, right. with even more to supersede it. Uh, the great delay in it is what in industry is known as a poor grid, which means that the power lines that we currently have for our high voltage just are kind of old. Right. <laughs> so, we we need to we need to, we need upgrade, to upgrade yeah our our cabling yeah it's just it's it's a bit slow it just can't take that and that is happening there are pockets within the the within Australia that are doing amazing um, work at upgrading these so um, we call them res renewable energy zones and those each of those zones are focused on putting the uh, government focus and um, and renewable energy uh, funding to those areas and they are the ones that are going to feed the major capital areas of right so we just like amount. spread out from those little like hubs basically yeah so we're looking at hubs of power generation where yep. we are going to have predominantly large-scale power generation whether it is wind hydro solar those are the primary ones in Australia. I can say that renewable energy zones, res spaces are located in such a way that they provide an efficient feed-in for into the energy grid that will power where the greater populace of Australia's population centres are. So whether that is Sydney and the outer townships that are most populated, likewise in Queensland. But what we're finding in Queensland, interestingly, is that we have res zones that are in central uh, central Queensland which uh, if anyone who's familiar with the state of Queensland you'll know that there are not that many there's people. nothing there yeah <laughs> <laughs> but what we do have and what Queensland is very well known for is a very um, a very large high voltage grid network so the feed-ins into that and then also the improvement of the um, the network itself quality yeah. is the emphasis here is high quality power that is from a renewable source from right. those areas. Now you've, you've worked with um, the mining industry. Are there any issues like uh, what is their desire for, for change in terms of um, energy production? 
Yes, so mining, they're very power hungry, so to speak. So for them, until recently, uh, their sole of the source of power the availability has been to access um, a grid network. Now, when you're looking at where these mines are, which is generally uh, quite remote areas uh, with very poor availability to, to access using conventional methods, um, what you find is that the cost to run connections from the sites to the main grid as a tie-in point, it's, very, it's quite an expensive ordeal. So, but what you're finding uh, when you do a cost analysis is that to implement a solar farm that can supplement that power with a battery storage system and a backup thermal or even wind system alongside of it is what a lot of these organisations, uh, not just in Australia, but because I'm familiar with the Australian um, landscape for mining and renewable energy, is that organisations, the mining, especially large mining organisations, they're using this, that they, think, they are thinking long term. So uh, what we're finding, especially from a, a place of where um, the industry I'm working in, is that um, mine science will have already been established and mm -hmm. they will have uh, commenced their operations potentially for extended years. Uh, but what they want to do is they want to firstly be um, socially ethical in its practices of power consumption um, and secondly reduce its cost margin. Uh, so cost, what yep. they're finding is if they are the, um, the off-takers of a solar farm where solar energy is free and the infrastructure is the paid-for element, mm -hmm. then their costs are going to reduce in terms of the running and the day-to-day -day operational costs of that particular enterprise. What about um, with, with the push to shut down coal power, is there ways for them to pivot what they're doing so that the, the companies themselves aren't obviously just going, oh, well, there's no demand and shutting down? Like how can they shift away from coal production? Yeah, that's a tough one. Yeah, <laughs> I, I can see what you're, what you're trying to get at, Rebecca, but um, uh, I think that's, that's a tough question because when you go into a particular area uh, geographically and you are mining for a particular mineral or, you know, exportable um, resource, really you have searched that you will have a, an adequate deposit there to make a profitable you know, project out of it, uh, for them to pivot is, um, so I'm thinking of uh, central Queensland, um, yeah. you know, high coal, clean coal, um, metallurgical coal, 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 coal. Here's the problem. It's really hard for them to pivot that. But that being said, I also want to give a case study, um, just a very short uh, a snapshot here, BHP and Shell. So Shell is um, is known, was, has been primarily known as that um, very faithful survey that you go to where you yeah. get your petrol from. Yep. Well, surprisingly in Australia in the last three years, Shell's input into Australia's renewable energy space as a principle where they are actually um, the investors and the asset owners for renewable energies especially in the wind sector, has right. greatly increased. So they have pivot, pivoted significantly, but they're not just in Australia. They're yeah. actually primarily based out of the Netherlands. And what you'll find is throughout Europe, there is this petroleum-founded enterprise who we associate with, you know, fueling cars, is now pretty much building the majority of wind and, and solar um, right throughout Europe. so that they, they, they've recognized that there's a shift culturally and a need and they're moving shifting their industry to meet the new need because otherwise yeah. your industry dies and you, yeah yeah so yeah, and there's that that major pivot yeah so do, do you think that that's going to be important for industries to take on board is to go don't try to like halt progress this is where we're going so you need to get on board with that well, if we are noticing that the BPs 
and the yeah that, those are huge companies like yeah if they can yeah. do it <laughs> if if our largest players of petroleum-based supply into Australia are pivoting to renewable power generation, I think it is something to be mindful of. Yeah. And it, we should be paying attention that this is not, it's, it's not, not a mess. fad. It's it's not going to go away. This is the future, no. basically. That's exactly right. Yeah. yeah. And it's a clean future. That, that's the key here. It's a clean future that helps society thrive because it improves the quality of our air, which improves the quality of what we breathe in and the impact it has on our health. It, yeah. just, it has so many ramifications, but it's a, just, it's a beautiful picture. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Like there, there's so many benefits all around. That's, that's great. Um, yeah. Would you say in, in closing, is there anything that ordinary Australians can do that would help us move closer to the UN's goals? Yeah, absolutely. Look, I would I would start by if you're in the market for a new car, maybe just hold off or consider not buying a new internal combustion engine, but do a cost analysis on how much it costs you today to fuel your car up and run it for a year. Compare that to how much it would cost for you to run, maintain a car that is an EV. Not this year necessarily because the prices are going down for electric vehicles. So that's the first thing we can do. Secondly, uh, I know we haven't touched on this a lot, but there is there are a lot more industries out there who that are involved in using renewable energy for the manufacture of your day-to-day -day goods, whether they are raw materials, whether they are to power uh, the manufacturing of the products that you purchase, just being a little bit, spending a little bit more time before you go and purchase that new device that you would like. Just consider um, where is the what is the equivalent of that particular. Um, yeah, say, what's what's the, the process microwave. going into the the manufacturing of it and what's its impact? Yeah. Is there a good way to find that information out, like it, to do that research? I don't believe there is a, a place where we can go to in Australia yet. Um, I in Europe there are uh, green there are websites specifically designated to being able to to do a quick search to see what enterprises are or, or what manufacturers what organisations are already using um, renewables. In Australia, I can tell you now that um, there are a lot of banking organisations that um, focus very strongly on getting um, on super on our superannuation mm -hmm. um, the portfolios are going more and more green so um, if you're even looking at things like your banking or your superannuation uh, have a look at the portfolios or even ask the question send that email out to your prospective superannuation um, or your current superannuation provider and ask them what is the portfolio um, of green because let's face yeah. it um, for those who aren't aware uh, green enterprises uh, in, on the stock market, they're doing quite well, you know. Right, um, yeah. It, it's not like a risky move or anything like that. It, it's actually a, a good what investment to be yeah. making. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And your super might actually improve Yeah, because you decided to, to ask the question. Yeah. So, so, so basically yeah. your advice is for people at home to just ask questions, look at what they're doing and interacting with in their daily lives, like their cars, their, the goods that they're purchasing, and try to make informed decisions surrounding that to support green energies. Absolutely. Absolutely. Awesome. Okay. Well, thank you very much for joining us today. It's been a pleasure to have you. Thank you. I wish that there's so much more that we haven't covered with relation to um, renewable energies, but um, even the, the little bit that we have, it uh, has been a pleasure to discuss. I would love to have you on again and we can go into more depths in any particular subjects that you want to cover as well. That would be absolutely fantastic.